It's live now. Okay, thank you. All right, let's kick it off. This is Mark Young. I'm joined with my esteemed colleague, Randy Cohen from Harvard Business School. Um, we're delighted everyone's joining us for this important podcast where today we're really talking about the Fed, interest rates, inflation, what the Fed did yesterday, and ultimately, most importantly, what the heck do you do about the current economic environment where things have uh, gone from financially a really strong tailwind-based investment approach. The more risk you took, the more money you made. And we're suddenly now, we're in this uncertain period where things that appear to be risky are being really harmed by the markets and things that are less risky, more conservative, more cash flow driven are less penalized by the market. But we'll get into that in a little bit. But bottom line, we're here to try to guide people through this challenging period in the markets. So firstly, we're delighted everyone's on this call. It is recorded for those that uh, need to consume this on a time shift basis. So Jerry, if you'd be kind enough, would you go to the next slide, please? So you can't have a part <coughs> where you're talking about business items without a disclaimer, and we have our disclaimer. So bottom line, this is intended to be financial education. If people are getting what they think is investment advice, that is not the intention of this podcast. But if you have investment advice from this podcast, you should certainly discuss this with your professional advisors, your investment management professionals, et cetera. So Jerry, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna let Randy, uh, it's kind of funny when I say this, but from my, my Harvard Business School days, which is over 20 years ago, professors like Randy love to cold call. So I'm, I have the tables turned. I'm gonna cold call Randy to tell the audience a little bit about Randy, his background, and not only what you're doing at Harvard Business School, but like many amazing professionals, you do have your fingers in some other pies and we'd be mm -hmm. delighted to hear what you're doing. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, terrific. Thanks, Mark. I'm so uh, as Mark says, I've been teaching at Harvard Business School. I actually been teaching there for uh, 25 years, with a little time off in in between to go teach across the river at MIT Sloan. Um, I love teaching. I teach. Uh, I've taught the investments course for many years. I teach the alternative investments course, which is an online course uh, that you can sign up for if you like. And um, uh, it's expensive, but it's not expensive the way a, 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 an in-person HBS education uh, is. So, uh, so by that standard, it's a bargain, and we think it's a terrific uh, online class. Um, and I also teach uh, entrepreneurship to an amazing group of students who are actually building businesses while they're in school. I've got about 72 teams I'm overseeing right now. And uh, from a research perspective, I try to understand markets. I try to understand uh, how to put a great investment portfolio together, choosing great managers, doing risk management, taking account of uh, the investment environment around. Um, and then as Mark says, you know, obviously if I'm gonna teach people about investments, uh, you don't wanna teach that out of textbooks. You really need to get out there and, and not only do research, but also be involved in the investments world. And uh, so I co-founded a firm called PEO Partners, where we've developed a form of liquid private equity. That is to say an investment that uh, uh, has a performance profile in terms of average returns and risk protection, similar to LBO or, or other private equity. Um, but that you can uh, sort of invest anytime and get your money back anytime. So it's very liquid. Um, and I also uh, work uh, closely with some other firms, uh, dear friends, that I, I helped uh, get started, including um, including a, a, a firm uh, called Longwall Investment Partners that does, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 help select great portfolios of uh, the most sophisticated uh, managers to, to help people um, manage all uh, investment environments. And what do you do with all your downtime? Yeah, exactly. Well, I've got uh, I've got three uh, wonderful uh, teenage kids, and uh, love uh, love hanging out with them. And um, you know, do uh, I, I do a lot of reading? I I, um, I have a podcast about blindness uh, called Dangerous Vision, where uh, but uh, I swear it's not depressing. We interview all kinds of fascinating people, most of whom happen to be blind, uh, but they're they're doing incredible things, uh, and some of whom are are not blind. You know, people who just are connected to the world of vision loss and blindness and curing uh, vision loss. Uh, so if uh, you know any people who are interested in that topic, check out Dangerous Vision with Randy Cohen on all your podcast 
uh, platforms. And I also uh, write about uh, pro basketball uh, for SB Nation. I write for uh, about my uh, hometown Philadelphia 76ers and about, uh, and about the league as a whole. Well, uh, all of those are basically podcasts themselves, but today we're <laughs> talking about what to do with uh, the current market. But thank you very much for that uh, illuminating commentary. So if uh, I guess, Jerry, would you be kind enough to go to the next slide, please? So this should look familiar to those that have been at our previous podcast. And I'll just highlight this very briefly, but it does map quite well into the conversation we're having today. So as people know, I formerly worked at a large global consulting firm where I headed up their global private wealth management. And at that firm, the approach we took at private wealth is your wealth is a four-legged stool. And in the far left, you can see these legs is really your net worth, which is your liquid and non-liquid investments. Non-liquid would be things like your house, your cars, et cetera. Those are in combination with your <coughs> your investment items. So that combination is your net worth. And we did a lot of work, which dovetails quite nicely into the conversation we're having today about how to have an all-weather portfolio to handle these situations. So it's that, trust and estate planning, tax planning, and I have to emphasize the word planning because, honestly, preparing a tax return is not highly sophisticated today, but finding people that can minimize future taxable events, reducing your tax burden, isn't a great opportunity, a big deal. And we help people with that. Lastly, is insurance. And again, we are not insurance brokers, but I can promise you the right insurance products give you an additional tax deferred vehicle that allow you to compound your investments without the burden of tax payments on them while they're in there. So that's a little bit of the four-legged stool of private wealth that we advocate. And you should know when I was at that firm previously, we would sit down with these partners and go through an education session. And I've had partners come back to me post that effort saying that this is the most valuable thing they got out of the firm. So, yes, it sounds like a story, but bottom line, we believe in this so strongly that for now, if you want to be exposed to this, we actually do it for free because we're here to help you. So reach out to us at the end of this podcast. You can see our contact information if you want to have that exposure. We'd be delighted to share that with you. Okay, enough of that. Jerry, the next slide, please. So this, again, will dovetail nicely into what Randy's going to share with us. But two key takeaways. If you look at that pie chart, which is a little hard to see, the majority of your return historically can be attributed to your asset allocation. Things like market timing and security selection don't really move the needle. It's this getting that asset allocation right is the critical thing. If you look at the far right, there's three separate portfolios, one that's all equities, one that's all fixed income, and oh, by the way, the optimal portfolio that we're advocating. And you can see our optimal portfolio has less risk than a bond portfolio, and it has more return than an equity portfolio. So you're in this upper left-hand quadrant, which is really where you want to be, where you have the highest return with the least risk. So let's go to the next slide, Jerry. Okay, I'm just going to set the stage here, and then, Randy, I'm going to let you use <coughs> So just some key economic numbers. All you have to do is pick up any newspaper. You can pick stuff. Employment in the – unemployment, excuse me, in the U.S. is hovering around 3.7% right now, which is extremely, extremely low. People call that full employment. But bottom line, wages and wage inflation is a problem right now. And the CPI – Presently is over 8%, and that's at a 40-year high. Let me repeat that, 40-year high. The uh, U.S. dollar has benefited by the Fed's aggressive tightenings, and on a trade-weighted basis, the dollar index is up over 14% for the year. Uh, consumer spending in August, even though we've had the Fed in their tightenings, is still robust. The uh, spending year-over-year year for consumers in the U.S. is up 7%. No, by the way, the S&P hasn't liked any of this stuff. The S&P is down almost 20% year-to-date. 
So Randy, that's the hand investors have been dealt. So maybe we'll start with the hypothetical question. Seeing all this information, knowing the Fed moved 75 base points yesterday, what is the Fed thinking? What are they doing? And are they behind the, the proverbial yield curve right now? Right. Well, so, you know, look, I think um, I think we now can see what Powell's uh, strategy is, which is to say um, he's absolutely bound and determined to make sure that we don't turn inflation into a permanent uh, feature of the landscape. And uh, and and as we know, there are a number of things driving uh, that can drive inflation. Uh, but one of the most important is expectations. If you get embedded expectations where everybody thinks we're going to have 7% inflation next year, then workers are going to ask for 7% raises in their next contract. People who are selling products to people, you know, for delivery six months from now are going to ask for a higher price uh, six months from now. And then what the, the expectations become reality. So if you are Jerome Powell, if you are the Fed, and you feel that uh, taming inflation is super important as they do, and as I think most people do, uh, then you absolutely need to convince the world that you are going to tame inflation no matter what it takes. That if that means putting us into recession, you'll do it, right? It doesn't mean you wanna put us into recession. Of course, they don't wanna put us into recession. Um, but from a uh, risk perspective, the question is, is it worth taking a chance of putting us in recession? And the answer is, um, they feel it is, because they have to let people know. And here's what's fascinating. The more convincing they are, the more people believe that they are going to do what it takes, the less they need to actually do, the less important it is that there actually be a recession. See, if people were sure that there was gonna be lots of inflation, then there would be inflation sort of by definition. And the only way to get rid of it would be to create a recession, okay? But if you can convince people, no, it's gonna be okay, then you don't actually need to have the recession. So now think about the fascinating challenge that the Fed and, and, and Powell face, right? What they, they don't wanna put us into recession. So here's what they'd really like to do. They'd like to convince us all that there are gonna be tons of huge rate hikes that are gonna uh, really have a huge effect on inflation and the economy, but not actually do the big rate hikes, right? Because if you, if you can fool people into thinking that there isn't gonna be inflation, then they'll tamp down their expectations and then you don't need to create the recession. But that's impossible, right? If they hadn't hiked rates at all the last six months and they just kept saying, I swear, we're really gonna do it, we're gonna hike rates, that would not be persuasive to the market. And then you'd see inflation expectations start to run out of control and those expectations can be self-fulfilling. So the, the, the circle that Powell's trying to square, in my humble opinion, is to convince people uh, that he'll do what it takes and do as little as possible while succeeding in convincing people of that. And as little as possible turns out to be quite a lot, right? We've had quite a lot of rate hikes and we'll have more. Um, but if he could do a little less and still have people convinced, he'd do it. Now, here's the question. Is it going to work? Will he be able to thread the needle um, and and uh, persuade people that, um, that they should keep their expectations? So look, he has succeeded in lowering people's inflation expectations. If you look at the 30 year tip sorry, sorry if you look at the um the short term uh inflation protected bonds and so forth you'll see the break even rates are very low the market seems to be expecting very low inflation so he's succeeding in that part of the goal but he's doing it by having quite large rate increases and so there is a very significant chance that this is going to lead us into a recession right and so then the question is but is it possible he'll get it just right and uh the, the proverbial soft landing where he, he gets the inflation down, but uh, we don't have the recession hit. And of course, I don't know. You know. Nobody knows for sure. The market prices are telling us that the market thinks there is a significant chance of a recession, but by no means a sure thing. It wouldn't be probably crazy to say 50-50 is sort of the general expectation on whether we're going to end up uh, falling into recession. I do worry about it a lot because we know there are very substantial lag effects here. In other words, we know that when you raise rates, the economy doesn't slow down immediately. It takes a period of time. Does it take two months? Does it take six months? Does it take 12 months? And eh, nobody really knows. There's a lot of complexity to that. So the economy is already, we already have baked into the cake some significant slowing compared to where we were. But as you said, Mark, you know, unemployment is at all time lows, right? There's tons of unfilled jobs. So we can afford some slowing without it being a true recession. 
Um, and so that's the question. And now let me add one last thing, which is, you know, many people say we're already in recession, right? We had two quarters of GDP drop the first two quarters. We're going to get Q3 uh, shortly. And so it's already a recession. And, you know, maybe that's true. But if so, it's a very weird recession where we keep adding, you know, three to 600,000 jobs a month. Um, so, uh, you know, the technical definition of recession is a, is a subtle and slippery thing. And so I don't want to get too into that, but what I'll say is, you know, when I use the term recession, I'm not so much worried about a technical definition of recession, which we may have already met in some people's minds, but rather about a question of, are we going to see a lot of suffering, a lot of unemployment, um, over and above the suffering we're getting just from, you know, people's wages, not keeping up with inflation. And, uh, you know, I hope not, I hope we don't go to really high unemployment, but that risk is there. Let me, let me ask you, uh, I'll just say a probing question, Randy. Um, I remember a quote from Warren Buffett, and I'm butchering the quote, but basically, when the tide goes out, you get to see who's been swimming, swimming naked. As the Fed marches down this path toward a potential recession, what will be the first crack? I've seen data suggesting the housing market is in, not deep trouble right now, but it certainly had, I believe, a 6% price decline from peak to trough this year. And with mortgage rates double what they were six to nine months ago, that's one place that will feel the effect of higher rates. So where's what's the genie that's going to come out of the bottle here? Yeah. Yeah, well, look, I mean, we've seen the first cracks. I mean, have, have, you know, crypto falling apart six months ago, could, you could say that was the first crack, you know, as a, you know, the, the most extreme risk assets tend to get hit first in these situations. Uh, but uh, I'm glad you brought up housing, because I do think that housing is a really problematic situation, and the people are not fully appreciating what's going on in housing. Um, and uh, in fact, I really feel like I should write this up, because I, I think there's a point here that is pretty definitely true, but that I'm not seeing pointed out anywhere, which is that people are misunderstanding what's going on in housing. Um, so imagine the following. Suppose last year you bought a building for a million dollars, okay? And you had a 3% long-term mortgage. And so you're paying 30,000 a year on the mortgage and you're renting it for 40,000 a year, okay? So you're happy, right? You're netting plus 10,000 a year. Um, maybe there was a down payment. I'm oversimplifying in lots of ways. There's taxes, there's insurance, but the upshot is if you bought this with no money down, you're making that money. Maybe it, it covers, you know, maintenance costs and so forth, but you're feeling good about that purchase. You feel like you paid a fair price. Okay. Now it's a year later. We've had 10% inflation, give or take, you know, or over you know, 15 months or whatever. Uh, so the price, so the rent is now not 40,000 a year, but 44,000 a year and your mortgage is fixed. So you're still paying 30,000 a year on your long-term fixed rate mortgage. So in your mind, this million dollar property is now worth more than it was, right? It's maybe worth 1.1 million. And let's say you decide you, you'd like to get some cash. So you put it on the market for 1.1 million and you talk to a potential buyer who's very calm, rational person. They're not trying to trick anybody. And they say, what are you talking about? I, I can't pay more than 700,000 for this property. 1.1 million is absurd. And you say, well, what do you mean? Look, it was worth a million and now it's worth more because the rent's higher. And they say, no, but I'm borrowing not at 3%. I have to borrow at 6%. And as you said, Mark, the mortgage rates have doubled. So I'm paying 60,000 a year in mortgage for 44,000 of rent. It's hugely underwater. I can't make that work. That's at a million, 66,000 if I pay a million one. I can only afford to pay around 700,000. I'm making up all these numbers, obviously, um, for this to look like an attractive deal to me. Now, how can this be true? How can it be? that for uh, Randy, the seller, this property seems like it's a bargain at a million and a fair deal at 1.1. And for Mark, the buyer, it seems like it's a total ripoff at a million, right? When we're both perfectly rational people. And the answer, as you probably all figured out, is that um, I don't own one financial asset in this scenario. I own two. I own a property and I own a mortgage. And my property has indeed gone from a million down to 700,000. The increase of in interest rates means that those future expected cash flows are worth less today than they were the day I bought it. And so the value of the property is way down, down around the 700,000 that you'd be willing to pay Mark. So why do I think it's worth a million one? Because the value of the mortgage has skyrocketed. When interest rates go way up, if you've locked in a fixed rate, 
then the value of that goes way up. Just as if you own a bond and interest rates go up, you lost money on your bond. Essentially, uh, the bank owns a bond on the mortgage holder <coughs> and the bank's position has suffered a loss, which means the mortgage holder has a gain. So my And so all everything going on in the housing market is dependent on this one little subtle fact of life, which is I cannot sell you my mortgage. If you buy that property from me, you do not get to take over my mortgage, right? And so therefore, there's no way you're going to buy the property. And not just you, there's no way anybody will buy. I mean, of course, you know, weird situations can, can happen. But, but fundamentally, no one should want to buy this property from me. It is worth 400000 more to me than to anyone else in the world because for me, I only get to keep this mortgage. See, not only can I not sell you my mortgage, I can't sell you the house but keep the mortgage. The bank will make me pay off the mortgage, right? So I'm throwing away 400000 if I sell the property. So now think about the implications of that. What it means is there are zillions of properties out there that are not going to be sold. The value of them has plummeted, but nobody is going to buy them at the new lower value. So how do we know that the value has plummeted? We don't. It doesn't show up in the data. There's no transactions at those new lower prices. Why are there any pro properties transacting? Well, obviously neighborhoods can change, right? So a place could become more valuable, canceling out the interest rate effect. But the big thing is, well, not everybody has a mortgage on their property or not everybody has a long-term fixed rate mortgage. If you bought a three-year arm and the three years have expired, your mortgage doesn't have any value anymore. So there's, you know, although if you sell, you'll have to sell lower, you won't, um, uh, you, you won't have any reason not to sell. There's nothing foolish about selling at that lower price. So what happens over time, obviously the economy is going to change every day in every way, but if the economy didn't change, then the way the housing market would open up is slowly over time, people's fixed mortgages would run out. Their arms would run out or their long-term mortgages would roll off or what have you. And then all of a sudden selling doesn't seem so crazy. But right now we are in a mode where for the vast majority of building owners, it makes no sense to sell them. And then, so the prices are way down, but it does not show up in the data. Now, obviously there's lots of smart people in real estate just as in every other part of the world. And there are people who probably are developing methods for trying to take account of this, but it is a huge overwhelming tidal wave of an effect. And so you really have to work overtime to adjust for it. Uh, and so I would guess that the true value of people's homes, including my own home that I'm sitting in, uh, has dropped much more than people realize. Let me just build on that real estate commentary. And again, this podcast is discuss your net worth or the audience's net worth in general. So I would categorize this conversation at the moment primarily about people's non-investable assets, which means their primary residence. So I just want to throw out another data point regarding that. So firstly, mm -hmm. people have been going from fixed to floating through these arms as a way to stay in the housing market through a cheaper mortgage. That's been evident in the data. And I heard a statistic that basically suggested every time a house transacts or trades, that puts $50,000 of incremental <laughs> stimulus into the market, whether it's the brokerage fee that goes to the real estate folks, the new couch you bought for the new house you moved into, et cetera. So there's this multiplier effect by the transactions occurring in real estate. And the fact that the purchases of real estate have been really declining rapidly, what do you see that doing to the slowdown, which the Fed is, is yeah. described as trying to put the, the, th the thread through the needle here. Yeah, it's 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 a problem, right? So so all right. So let's start with this. To the extent that we like to be very concrete and and uh, give people information they can use. Like uh, again, as Mark says, this is education. This is not investment advice. But uh, you know, I'll just say I'll educate you by saying that my dad had a beach house that he's owned for a very long time, and now he's in his 80s, and he really can't maintain it, so he doesn't use it much. He was renting it, and he had an opportunity to sell it for basically the price that it was worth a year ago when he thought about selling it but decided not to. And I was like, Dad, if you can sell a house for what it was worth a year ago, you should make that sale. That is an exciting opportunity to, to make a sale. So that is how I'm thinking of the investment situation in real estate. And, and of course, the same applies if you're thinking of buying a piece of real estate. I feel like given where mortgage rates are, given where interest rates are, um, you should get a price much better 
than than what it was worth a year ago. And if and if you can't, I would think about waiting because I do think that six or twelve months from now uh, we'll have better price opportunities. Or if we don't, it'll be because we had so much inflation and you could have benefited from that inflation by by you know investing the money in the short term and still be better off uh, when you go to to buy that property. Now, what about the sort of stimulative effect of housing? I'm not so sold on the stimulative effect of paying a fee to a broker. I mean, if I you know, sell a house and then I take money out of my bank account, give it to the broker and it goes into the broker's bank account. Do I think that the money in the broker's bank account is more stimulative than the money in my bank account? Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. I'm not super sold on that. But I am sold on the general concept you're, you're raising, Mark, because um, two, there are two problems. And look, we, 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 we all lived through the 2008 financial crisis. So if we cast our minds back, well, remember, what goes wrong if the housing prices are all down a lot? Right. The first thing that goes wrong is huge problems for financial institutions. Now, after the 2008 financial crisis, we put in a bunch of safeguards and guardrails and railheads and, you know, whatever uh, uh, to try to uh, protect the banks from being driven into, you know, bankruptcy or near bankruptcy by changes in the real estate market. And all I can say is fingers crossed, you know, let's hope that those do the job. I know, we know that that the banks worked hard to unwind a lot of those restrictions in the intervening 14 years and or 13 years, and they probably had some success, uh, but hopefully the banks are better situated either because the regulations worked or because the banks themselves decided to be a little more cautious. Um, but that is one concern. And I haven't read anybody saying, oh, right now we should be terrified that the banks are going to go under because of real estate dropping. So I'm not saying to you that that's something to be terrified about now, but you know, let's just all keep our eye out. Um, many of you probably know that the best blog thinking about these issues of real estate values and all the best thing on the internet is called Calculated Risk Blog. Uh, they were very early in 2008 letting people know what was going to happen, and they just have continued to give great wisdom ever since. And so Calculated Risk, if you want to uh, be up to date on that kind of thinking. Um, but there's a second thing that goes bad when people when real estate values are down, and that is people don't want the is is uh, the builders right like a if 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 a new house is worth a million dollars then it's going to make sense for somebody to buy up a chunk of woods knock the woods down and build a bunch of houses on on that land and uh and if uh if a nice house is worth a million and a not so nice house is worth four hundred thousand, it's going to be worth someone's while to buy a not so nice house and put in a bunch of improvements to turn it into a million dollar house and that is work those are jobs for people who improve houses for plumbers electricians all the trades folks um as well as some unskilled labor too and uh that does uh tend to be way less if houses aren't worth as much and so i do think it's going to be a big impact on the economy in fact if you said to me if you said hey randy um it's um it's it's june of 2023 and we're mired deep in recession and sure interest rates had something to do with that but what's the mechanism by which we ended up in recession i would tend to point to two things i would say number one whenever there's an oil shock it's very likely you end up with a recession. We had a bad oil shock, uh, and uh, although it's easing now, uh, you know there's lots of lags in things. So that's one problem. And the other is high mortgage rates leading to lower housing prices leading to a recession. Um, while I'm on it, sorry, I know I, I go on and on whenever you ask me a question, but one thing leads to another, as you say. Um, uh, why do I think, um, what, 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 how do we end up with an oil shock, right? Well, obviously Russia, Ukraine was a significant factor uh, in that. But oil prices were way up before Russia invaded Ukraine. There was a story that was floating around uh, that was very popular for a while that was like, oh, uh, you know, the Joe Biden won't let people drill for oil and stuff that 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 was not true. Oil oil, oil drilling uh, has been going up all through uh, this administration. Um, what what happened is this. You all might remember a couple years ago. Uh, that the price of oil went negative very briefly, but still there was a day when if you could drive a truck up to the hub and and um, and uh, fill it up with oil, they would pay you to take the oil away. Right. And so what was the situation there? Well, the economy had slowed down so much due to COVID. People were driving so much less that uh, there wasn't enough places to put all the oil. Right. And so the price of oil literally went in. The, the literally negative was a fluky, weird thing. But overall, oil prices were shockingly low. So what do oil producers do in that situation? What do the frackers do? What are the what are the traditional you know, deep well drillers do? Well, of course, what they do is they stop producing. They shut down the fields. It doesn't make sense to pay somebody to drill out or, or dig out a bunch of oil that isn't worth anything or that's worth very little. So they shut those fields down. Well, so then over time, we, you know, COVID 
did what it did and the economy started to come back. And when the economy started to come back, of course, there was more demand for oil, but those fields were all shut down. And it takes time to get them going again. You have to hire all the skilled people to go out and, and to dig up those oil and get the transportation logistics in place and do all those things. And it just takes time for the economy to come back. Now, the good news is capitalism is just fantastically good at solving problems like this, right? And man, if that oil price is high enough, people are going to get out there and drill for oil and the oil is going to show up. But it may take six months, 12 months, whatever. And that's what we suffered through with those super high gas prices a few months ago. And now it's back down to more reasonable levels because uh, the, the producers have caught up. Well, Randy, again, best fascinating observation of the leads and lags of the real economy and monetary policies, medicine, which also had leads and lags on it. And that's why, as you were rightly pointing out, the Fed's credibility and the market's confidence in their ability to control inflation is so sacred. And I'll use an extreme example, places like Argentina, which forever has had hyperinflation, and there's much more complexities to the Argentina situation, but in Latin America, you've had hyperinflation for a very long time, and mm -hmm. there's not confidence in the financial system to control it. The old joke was when you're in a taxi cab in Argentina, do you pay the taxi driver before the trip starts or at the end? And the answer is at the end because it got cheaper because of the mm -hmm. hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. so, bottom line, Fed's credibility and market's belief in their credibility is really one of the underpinnings here. And just to remind people, the Fed has two mandates. And Randy... Again, I get the cold call you. I, I get a kick out of doing this because I'm getting my feedback back in all these years. What's the Fed's dual mandate? Yeah, so the dual mandate is um, that, uh, that they are concerned with both maximizing employment and with uh, keeping inflation low and stable. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny because, uh, gosh, back, this is back probably, you know, in the, in the aughts. I remember somebody saying, literally like in the middle of a speech, they're like, and don't forget about the third mandate. And there was just this huge wave of laughter through the room because they didn't need to explain it. The third mandate, of course, is uh, don't let the stock market go too low, you know? And, and so there was a real feel, there, there have been feelings from time to time that every time the stock market goes down a bunch, the Fed says something soothing so as not to crash the markets. I think that um, the, the current Fed in the current time is not uh overweighting the third mandate which i think is good i mean you know i'm not going to say that that should never be something that they should think at all about but i think there's probably some history if you look over the past few decades of the fed sometimes not worrying after all how many unemployed people do the fed board members know not many right and so does you know there have been times i think when the fed has worried not quite enough about whether unemployment is at six percent or six point two percent you know even though that's you know that 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 point two percent um, is hundreds of thousands of people out of work, having their lives ruined um, and worrying uh, a little more maybe than, than it needed to about, about the market. But I think there was a real feeling in, in the last couple of years that, gosh, if anything, the market seems to be weirdly high. And, and, uh, you know, and, and, and so if the market were a little lower, it wouldn't necessarily be the worst thing in the world. Not that the Fed wants a lower market, but just that uh, they're not going to ruin people's lives to, to prop up the market. And, uh, and so anyway, but coming back to your question, yeah, that combination of striving for uh, low and stable inflation and low unemployment is, a, is very difficult. And, and look, the Fed probably, um, you know, isn't getting much credit uh, for the fact that unemployment is so low. And I'm not saying it's due to the Fed that unemployment is so low, but, you know, when people uh, focus on the economic situation, they do have a tendency to look at whatever's not doing well. So if unemployment's high, they're upset about unemployment. If inflation's high, they're upset about inflation, you know, totally understandable. Uh, there's this old concept, uh, Arthur Oaken's concept, the misery index, where you add the inflation rate and unemployment rate and say kind of the two together, uh, give you an idea of how bad things uh, are. Um, and the answer is, well, by that measure, it doesn't look too terrible now because, you know, everybody's got a job and a job. A friend of mine a couple of years ago said, look, if you have a job and a job offer, you're doing all right. You know, then you feel like you, you have a job and plus your boss has to treat you OK because you've got an offer. And so we do have that going in the economy. But what we're missing is the part where you make a little more each year than the year before. This year, people are making net of inflation maybe 2% less than they made a year before. And that sucks, right? It sucks. People expect not to have to go to the supermarket and buy you know, less uh, than they bought a year ago. People think, hey, I work hard. Uh, I'm smarter than I used to be. And I ought to make a little more, not a little less. And so um, you know, there, there's a real battle to fix these problems. I think what you just said as an answer is a beautiful segue into what people should do 
in the current environment with all this uncertainty and challenges. So I'm going to just use a hypothetical. If you won the lottery, and not the Mega Millions lottery, but hypothetically, you just came into a million bucks, just to pick it up. Yeah, a, me- a mere million. One yeah. million dollars, in the words of Dr. <laughs> Evil. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and start with the fixed income or the credit side of the equation. Yeah. And you don't ever want to put all your eggs in one basket. That's know, right. Et cetera. So with the hand that's been dealt, the uncertainty about the Fed and raising rates and inflation and real return versus nominal return, et cetera, what should people do on the credit side of the equation today? Yeah, it's um. so uh, look, there's actually there's a couple of huge opportunities. And, and shoot, I should have looked this up uh, this morning because, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> my figures are about three days out of date and markets move. But um, I can tell you that as of the <coughs> as of the other day, um, there, there was a, a, well, sorry, let me start with the absolute no brainer. Um, there's a, there's a ridiculous free money opportunity out there. Everybody should know about it. And that is the series I savings bond, uh, sometimes called the I bonds and uh, wall street journal did a piece on it maybe four months ago. So, so a lot of you may have seen this, uh, but don't miss this opportunity. The sad news is it's only $10,000 per family member. So, you know, if it's a, if your family unit has, you know, two adults and three children, you can buy $50,000 each year worth of these bonds. And they pay a rate that is set based on inflation that last I looked was over 9%. They are completely and totally safe. It's a U.S. Treasury bond. We get 9%. They reset the rate each year. And the genius of these bonds is if the rate stays high, you can just keep getting this very, very high, safe interest rate. And if the rate drops, you can cash them in and the government just gives you your money back. You got all the interest and then you get your money back. So it is the lowest risk, highest returning opportunity out there really just extraordinary and you know yeah if you just got if you just got a million fifty thousand is not a huge percentage but it's five it's a five percent allocation to something completely safe totally liquid and great so series i savings bond aka i bonds you can buy them at the post office i think or you can probably buy them on the internet as well all right so that's one second and this is a totally different bond it's a little confusing because the names sometimes seem a little similar um the tips bond the treasury inflation protected securities right? This is the fantastic security. I say fantastic because it's so great for economists. We've learned so much from being able to study these bonds whose value moves up and down with inflation. The higher inflation is, the more you get paid. And so you get inflation protected as the name would suggest. And people call them the TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. As of the other day, the January 15th TIPS bonds were paying um, inflation plus 4% on an annualized basis. So Ask yourself in your mind what you think inflation is going to be over the next 12 months. Now, there's wide differences of opinion. There's people who think we're going to have zero or negative inflation. There's people who think the Fed's going to get it to 2%. There's people who think it's going to be 6%, 8 10%. There's people who think we're going to have runaway inflation. But if we just use 6% for a moment, uh, just as a number, I mean, the core inflation last month was up 0.6% for the month. Uh, which would be 7.2 uh, annualized, right? So let's say we think, well, but oil prices are falling, so it's going to be six. Well, at 6% inflation between now and January, um, again, 6% annualized inflation. It's always a little confusing, the monthly versus the annualized, but I'm just going to use annual numbers. 6%, you get plus four, again, as of the other day, and I doubt it's moved hugely, although it may have moved a little bit. Six and four is 10. So this is a bond you can buy that lasts for four months, okay? So super liquid you can sell it anytime you want it's totally liquid okay but if you don't sell it you'll get your money back in four months and essentially you pay about 98 dollars, and you're going to get back 100 plus however much inflation there is between now and january which if you think we're having six percent annualized inflation then you guess we'll have about two percent inflation over those four months so you give them 98 you get back 102 you make four percent in four months right maybe a little less so 10 or 12% annualized, again, for a completely safe, in fact, you could argue this is the safest security in the world, because it's not only completely guaranteed by the US government, but, um, and it's super short term, so even if something crazy is gonna happen with the US government someday, it's not gonna happen in the next four months, but you're also protected if inflation goes crazy. And that does not have limits. You can buy millions worth of that bond. So that is a huge opportunity, okay, in my humble opinion. Now, if you think inflation is gonna be negative between now and January, you're like, yeah, it's not that great. Right. But okay, that's two. So then at a very big picture level, 
if we start to look at riskier bonds, right, riskier things you can do in fixed income to get high returns, what I'd say is I'm not very excited about long-term bonds. The rates on long-term bonds are still not very high. And it seems to me that the risk is very high, right? Because we don't know, you know, although I do think Powell is going to succeed in taming inflation, we don't know how high he's going to have to push up rates to do it. The last time inflation was in this neighborhood was when I was a teenager in the early 80s, and they had to push up rates to like, you know, 15% or something to tame inflation. I don't expect anything like that this time, but it's not out of the question. So to me, to buy very long-term bonds in this setting uh, seems very risky. I would look at shorter-term securities. Um, you're going to be taking on some credit risk. And since there's a real recession possibility, you want to be very diversified and look for very short term. You know, you look for things that are six or 12 months, even a if a recession hits in the next six to 12 months, um, a lot of the bite of it takes time to filter through to companies. Um, so I think you can find shorter term assets that are paying high yields and where the risk is moderate, especially if you diversify across a bunch of different ones. Okay. That's a great answer on the, Fixed income side, I'll, I'll just say in my simple words, you want to be cautious and proverbial play defense, not offense in this uncertain period. So low duration, fixed income, things like floating rate securities, high credit quality, corporate securities, et cetera, but the emphasis on short term, not long term. So minimize duration risk. What, what do you do with the uh, equity side of the equation? Yeah, on the equity side, I think there is a really uh, powerful thing going on, which is, uh, and it's funny because it kind of links to fixed income, right? Normally it's in fixed income that we talk about the concept of duration, right? And duration basically means how long does it take to get your money back? So if you have a 30 year zero coupon bond, it has a duration of 30 years, of course. But if you have a 30 year bond that pays you a 5% coupon every year, and then you get your money back at the end, the duration of that might only be 12 years or 14 years because the money that you're getting back in the short run has a lot of value compared to that money that's 30 years in the future, so heavily discounted. So you can think of stocks as having durations too, right? And so the duration of a stock is, well, take all the dividends that you're ever going to get from that company and then say, what's the weighted average time at which you get your money back? And the weighting is based on, um, is based on time value of money. So you might think, well, wait a minute, if the company goes on forever, isn't the, isn't the duration infinity? But the answer is no, because that money you get a thousand years from now, discounted back to today is worth almost nothing. So the money you're getting in the next 50 or 100 years is going to be all the value. And the money in the early years has a lot of weight. Okay, so um, what kinds of companies have what kinds of duration? Well, growth stocks, right? If you think, you know, Tesla just as a canonical growth stock these days, you know, people think Tesla is worth a trillion dollars or whatever. <clears throat> because not because it's paying out so much in dividends today, but because the view is they're going to grow and be hugely successful and that 30, 50, 70 years from now, you're going to get enormous amounts of money from your Tesla investment, right? Whereas some, you know, uh, dirty old oil services company, you know, selling, selling tanker trucks or whatever, uh, that company, um, the, the value is almost all in dividends you're going to receive over the next 10 years. Nobody thinks that company is likely to pay you out huge bundles of money 50 years from now. It's going to be a whole different world by then. So um, how does this tie into interest rates? Well, if the interest rates are way up, then that should really have a huge impact on the value of companies where the cash flows are very far in the future. Because instead of discounting a big payout 50 years from now, at 2% a year for 50 years, you're discounting it at 3.5% a year for 50 years. Well, that might be the difference, you know, that might be a factor of two, three, four on the value. It's an enormous difference. Whereas if a company's giving you all the money this year, next year, five years from now, eh, change in interest rates doesn't matter very much. So what we should have observed in this crash is that broadly speaking, growth stocks should have gone down much, much, much more than value stocks. And what we have observed is that growth stocks have gone down a little bit more than value stocks, but not nearly as much more as intuition or spreadsheeting uh, would suggest. Um, I have a neat slide in one of the presentations I give, which shows the Austrian 100-year bonds. The country of Austria has a 100-year bond, right? So a 100-year bond has a duration in excess of 50 years, probably, again, the point I made earlier. So the question is, 
but it's a it's a sovereign bond from a nation that is a credible country. So I don't think anybody really thinks Austria is not going to pay their bonds back. I mean, I guess with Putin being so aggressive, you could imagine him steamrolling across Europe and taking over Austria and not paying off their bonds, but it doesn't seem likely, right? So, so if we say, okay, if we want to look at a pure play effect of how much does the interest rate affect a high duration asset like, like a growth stock or like that long-term Austrian bond. We can look at the Austrian bond and the answer is it's down about 65% since the peak last November, 65% in less than a year. So logically what you'd think is, well, growth stocks should be down about that amount because of the interest rate changes. And then they should be down more because the economy is really scary right now. But instead growth stocks are down maybe 25 or 30% from the peak, not 60 or 80%. Um, so. If you ask me what to hold now, what I'd say is tilt towards value, uh, don't tilt towards growth, because if the market crashes, the value, you're not going to get hurt nearly as bad. By the way, I'll add, you could also uh, uh, tilt towards low beta, which is correlated with value, but is a little bit different. So low risk, low volatility, low beta stock. So that's what I would look at is I would look at the low risk, low duration companies, and I would tilt away from uh, the high volatility um, growth stocks with their money far out in the future. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, you asked me earlier about things I work on and, and I co-founded a company, PEO Partners, and we do this liquid private equity. Of course, private equity firms hold these low risk, low duration, high profitability companies. And so of course, in our liquid PE strategy, that's exactly the kind of thing that we invest in. And we invest in it because we believe in it generally across all markets, but this seems like a particularly attractive time to be in that kind of asset. Plus, because we need to replicate the crash protection that PE offers, we also hedge against crashes. So we feel like we're doubly protected if a recession hits and really bad times come for the market. Let's let's just, Randy, let's spend a minute on the private side of the market. You mentioned your liquid private equity firm. And my experience looking at the vintages of private equity, they tend basically you don't want to market time private equity either. So if you're in the long-term private equity investment business, you buy multiple vintages over time. That mm -hmm. way you smooth out the ups and downs. But what I recall, and I'd like your thoughts on this, buying a private equity investment pool at a stage like we're in now tends to do really well over time because you basically benefit from the discount. So when they're out shopping for deals, they now are paying a cheaper price. So how do you think about that? Uh, look, if somebody will tell, will let you buy all the private equity deals they do this year, uh, that seems pretty attractive to me, right? The difficulty is the two products that are out in the market are primary private equity, where you sign up for a private equity fund, and then they'll probably close their first deal six months from now and close their last deal six years from now. And you're going to get a mix of deals that happen over that six months to six years period, which is very different from buying the stuff that is available right now, right? And so uh, that, um, so then you say, well, what about secondary private equity? Secondary private equity, you buy a pool of private equity assets that were previously invested in. The problem there is private equity has not marked their books down this year. Um, private equity uh, overall is, I think, up slightly this year. So ponder that a little, right? So the market is down about 20%, as you said, and uh, and private equity is, is basically flat for the year. So one possibility is that the value of the stuff they own didn't drop during the year, even though all the public companies dropped hugely. The other possibility is that they're using mark-to-market -market accounting to say, well, you know, since we didn't sell it, we don't really know what it's worth. And so we're going to say it's worth about the same as it was. So then the problem is if you go buy that, uh, there's a good chance you're overpaying, right? So, um, so that's my only concern. I, I do think uh, that you know, private equity as a long-term investment has appeal. Uh, I like your point about not trying to market time in private equity. What, what I'd say is if anything, you need to avoid, you need to cancel out the natural market timing of private equity. Like if you go to a bunch of people and you say, what does it mean for there to be a hot market in private equity? Half the people will tell you, oh, a hot market is when lots of deals are getting done. And half the people will tell you, oh, a hot market is when prices are really high. And they'll both be right. 
because when the deals are getting done is when prices are high. So the problem is if you just naturally invest in all private equity, you're going to tend to buy in at the time when the prices are the highest and to not buy in very much when things are down. What you'd really like to do is buy new private equity deals right after a crash. And arguably now is that time. Um, but it's just a little tricky because private equity funds tend to be so slow putting the money to work. But if you can find a fund that's going to put the money to work just from now till 18 months from now, you know, have a really short dispersion period uh, or, um, uh, you know, period of, of putting the money out. Uh, that sounds pretty attractive to me, just as you say. Well, I'm going to take what you just said, and this is going to sound like a commercial for Bridgepoint. And it's not intended to be a commercial for Bridgepoint. But our model is a deal by deal model or SPV based, mm. which stands for special purpose vehicle. So at Bridgepoint, we're always scouting for deals that we think have a great risk reward associated with them. So in our case, now we're investing in companies that have great upside with, frankly, today's price. So I think that is another way to deal with this proverbial market timing when you're a pool mm. and they're deploying capital over time, et cetera. So that may be no, a way to correct no, it. Yeah. No, one, no one will believe me because obviously we work together, Mark, up, but but I actually swear that I was not thinking of that when I made that point. No, I, get I it. really I was really just trying to nudge the private equity world, which look, I've been sending my best students off to private equity for 25 years. It's such an interesting sphere and it's um, and the money is so good for people who work as private equity you know, analysts and partners that my, often my very, very best students go to work in that area. And I'm really impressed with what they do, but I think there are some issues with the structure of the private equity industry that lead to net performance for investors that's not as good as the talent and the skill that they're bringing to bear justifies. And so, you know, I feel it's a little bit of my role in society to say, hey, these guys are awesome, but they could do even better if they had a better model. And that was really the point I was making. But I have to admit that you make a good point that Bridgepoint's model is is sort of closer to what I uh, think uh, think is is ideal for investors to be able to put money to work at the times when the opportunities are juicy. All right, well, thank you. I do want to open it up for questions. And Randy, we do have a question. You may or may not be able to answer this one, but we will get the answers very shortly. But uh, Krista Murrayman, the question is, where can you buy tips bonds, Randy? Yes. So uh, I actually know the answer to this. And the reason right. I know is because I called my sister and I said, Sherry, you got to buy these bonds. And they're, they're a really great deal. And she then went and researched it and said that indeed um, she can do it right through her brokerage account, right through a, you know, whatever, Schwab account, Fidelity account, you name it, uh, just regular brokerage account, you can go right ahead and, uh, and buy those bonds. So call your broker, or if you're good with the online thing, uh, you can buy them uh, through the online system. Well, and by the way, if, and by the way, if you want the price update, I believe if you type, um, WSJ, Wall Street Journal, WSJ tips yields and click, uh, then the price, the price page from the Wall Street Journal will pop up on your browser. And if somebody wants to do that and look at the January 15th uh, tips bonds and just, you know, in, in the chat or, or at, you know, at Telmark, uh, what the current number is, over the past month until a few days ago, which was the last time I looked, they ranged from plus two and a half to plus four and a half. And the last time I looked, it was plus four. Um, but so if anybody finds that number, sorry, I, I don't know if all of you know this, I'm blind. So I'm not a guy who can just like reach over with my left hand and look this up on my keyboard while I'm talking to you guys. Um, but um, but if somebody wants to look it up and share the number with us, we'll know the latest. But anyway, back to you, Mark. All right, thank you, Randy. And I'm delighted you had the answer. So that's good. OK, um, I'm going to open it up to the audience again. If anyone has any questions for Randy or me, this is the time to put your questions in the comment box. And if there are no other questions, I'll have a final question for Randy. We're getting near the end of our hour slot anyway. So um, feel free if you have a question. If you don't, it means Randy com covered everything perfectly, which is probably also true. But um, hey, you'll, never you'll never cover everything in the financial markets. That's what keeps us finance professors in business, Mark. There's always, always more to learn. Well, you're the person staying on top of it, so, so thank you. For By the way, if we if we if we have a minute, Mark, I'll, I'll tell I'll tell everybody about the most amazing uh, finance research paper I've seen in the last five years. 
Well, I'd love to hear about that. What, what do you got? All right. So, so this paper, it got a little bit of publicity when it first hit. So some of you may have heard about this already. Uh, two of the very best scholars in the field, really just absolutely amazing people. Uh, Ralph Koijin, whose name I know I'm horribly mispronouncing because he's, he's Dutch, but uh, I, we, you know, we Americans just have to do our best. And Xavier Gabes, whose name I'm also probably mispronouncing, Xavier is French, um, wrote this amazing paper called The Inelastic Markets Hypothesis. And they went to see if their intuition was right in terms of what people expected. They surveyed people all over academia and all over Wall Street. And they said, look, suppose a firm, let's say a financial firm, go say, you know, JP Morgan took a billion dollars that they'd been sitting in cash and said, you know what, over the next quarter in Q4, we're going to buy stocks with this money, right? They don't have to make a big announcement. We're going to buy stocks and we're going to do it in a slow, careful way across the entire market, you know, the whole S&P 500 or Russell 3000. Um, so we're gonna buy hundreds and hundreds of stocks slowly and carefully over the course of three months. How much higher will the total value of the market be at the end of three months as a result of their buying? So there's no new information, there's no new anything, but you know, you've got quote unquote buying pressure, okay? So the typical academic and the typical Wall Streeter both said zero right? Zero or so close to zero as makes no difference. I mean, you know, could the total value of the market be $100,000 higher? Sure. But, you know, across a billion dollars of purchases, basically no effect on the value of the market. Okay. And so, uh, in fact, the 95th percentile answer was zero. 95% of respondents said, no, it's just not, how could that matter? It's, a, it's only a billion across a $50 trillion US equity market and spread carefully over many months of buying. So you're not, you know, pounding anything, right? The answer turns out to be that the value of the market as a whole goes up by $5 billion based on 1 billion of purchases, okay? Now, obviously the percentage growth in stock prices is still small because you've got this enormous market, right? So it's a basis point, essentially 5 billion out of 50 trillion. I don't know exactly what the market's worth these days, probably around 50 trillion, you know, it's a basis point or two, right? But the point is $5 up for every dollar of purchasing, absolutely mind boggling. And yet, I swear to you, if you watch Ralph or Xavier pre present this paper, or if you just go read it, you will be 100% sure they are correct. It is the most convincing paper I have seen with relative to how surprising the result is. I mean, people can always be convincing if uh, if they um, if, uh, if if the results if you if you already knew it was true beforehand. But this is a shocker, and yet it's obvious they're right. And what they ask is a simple question: Who is out there in the market who's going to sell? just because somebody is in there buying a little more. Is it gonna be ETFs? Absolutely not. Every dollar in an ETF is already invested. They can't, they, they're not gonna go and say, oh, now we wanna be less invested. Is it a mutual fund? No, they're already invested. They're not gonna change their investment strategy just because somebody comes in. Is it gonna be retail investors? If anything, retail investors are probably more likely to buy if prices are going up, right? So you essentially need a huge move in prices, relatively speaking, for somebody to say, you know what, that price went up enough, I think I should sell a little here. And it turns out that the ratio is about five to one. Um, now in an individual stock, the ratio is lower, still shocking in its way. But in other words, if you poured a billion dollars into one company, you aren't gonna move the value of that individual company by five billion, but you will move it a lot. Um, and so this changes a lot about what we think about price pressure and markets, a lot of things where I as an academic and my friends would have sort of rolled our eyes at talk about price pressure making uh, a huge impact. Uh, we really have to recalibrate based on this new information. So that's uh, that's the most interesting thing I learned in the last uh, in the last month. Well, let me say a couple things. And this is leading toward next steps, Randy. But firstly, we're now at the end of our one hour session. But I'm gonna ask you to come back at another time, but I'd love to share your insights on that paper and what it means to investors. But again, I I didn't know what you just said. And I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I will say for investors, they love it at the top and they hate it at the bottom. And right. it, you know, as it goes up, people want to buy more. And as it declines, they don't see this as a buying opportunity. They see this as more the fear side than the greed side. But right. That's a whole nother discussion we can certainly have at another time and place. I, I'd, be, I'd be eager to because that's indeed the subject of my dissertation that I'm still proud of after 25 years. So, uh, yes, eager to get into that next time. Okay, beautiful. So, again, next steps because we're at the end. Uh, firstly, Randy, I want to basically offer you out, if I may say it that way, to yeah. the audience. People have requested one-on-one -on -one time with 
frankly, esteemed speakers like yourself. And you're in New York quite often. I believe next week, Tuesday and or Wednesday is a time you might be able to meet a select yeah. few people for dinner. So people on this call, if they want to join us for dinner with Randy next week, there's uh, an email on the slide here. Yeah, we just flipped to it. So email me and say if you're interested or not, we can coordinate it. But uh, I think it would be phenomenal for those that are interested to have some one-on-one -on -one time with Randy, who I'll just say it myself, and is an absolute wizard, absolute genius in the financial markets. And it's a real privilege to have you and your expertise shared with our audience and our network. So firstly, that's one thing I wanted to put out there. Uh, secondly, you know, you mentioned this other paper, so definitely want to take advantage of that opportunity. And lastly, one final question, but it's really related to a bridge point item, not your conversation that you've had with us, Randy, but Krista Merriman's asking, we have a deal that's closing now and it's called Curio uh, Digital Therapeutics, which mm -hmm. again, I'm not here to dis describe who they are, what they do, but it is <coughs> a uh, digital therapy solution for mental health. And it's, tar it's dedicated to women's mental health. And as an example, women who have a pregnancy, over 20% of women get postpartum depression. And it's in my non-scientific brain, it's because your hormones and your body's going through all this trauma and changes that it does trigger depression in many people. And sadly, people who have children are stigmatized to say, this is the happiest time of your life. You have no reason to be depressed. You can't be depressed and shut up and get on with it. But it's a medical fact that over 20% of women have this problem. So this firm, this company is dedicated to treating mental illness women, not only for postpartum depression, but for menopause and other things that frankly even stigmatized and are ignored. So the whole mental health field is ripe for disruption and digital therapeutics in combination with pills, or I'll just say therapeutics or medicine, the combination of the two is a much better approach to dealing with this problem. So. The answer, Krista, to your question, there is a little time left. So if you'd be kind enough to reach out to me after this call, I'll be happy to discuss that with you. And uh, that, that's it for me. We went three minutes over. So forgive me for those that had a hard stop at 930. But again, thank you, everyone, for being on the at, at, H, at HBS, if we if we go three minutes over, then the students don't applaud for us at the end. So they have trained us like seals <laughs> to make sure we don't go three minutes over. And when I worked in London, on time was five minutes early and you same thing. You better be done at the time you said you were done. So shame on me for going over three minutes to plug our uh, current deal called uh, Curio. So thank you, everyone. Have Thanks, a everyone. Day. And Randy, as always, it's a pleasure, buddy. Thank you so Cheers, much. Cheers, everyone. All right, bye.